Yeah, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, like Nils, I look forward to this uh, great occasion. I think everybody I ever met in this field is here, and, and that makes it uh, a very special occasion. I want to thank again, and especially uh, Dr. Jack Templeton for his very generous support uh, for this event and for so many of us over so many years. And of course, I want to especially thank my good friend, Michael Velker, who is, of course, the ultimate organizer and does that incredibly well. I want to do uh, uh, two things in the short time that I have uh, today to briefly discuss with you. Uh, let me just get this watch out here before Vim starts signaling. I wanted to do things, uh, two things. First, uh, I want to try to show how at this point in my own career, in my own work in, in theology and science, uh, how I think I could fine tune uh, what it is that the methodology is about uh, in the field we use, and what it is the, uh, what it defines the kind of template that I f find myself using uh, when I work in a, a specific uh, field or program which, about which I also want to say something. So secondly, after doing that, I do want to, uh, against this background, give a brief abstract uh, to try to illustrate where I might go in terms of uh, problem solving in, in theology. Uh, and I'm not sure yet, Nils, whether this might qualify as a thought experiment, maybe not in this big sense, but, uh, but this is an abstract of my current project, and here, too, I want to uh, thank the Templeton Foundation for uh, a, a research grant that is making uh, this work possible. So, uh, in some of my recent work, I have argued uh, that a post-foundationalist notion of rationality should open our eyes to the kind of epistemic obligation that we have been talking much about here. The kind of obligation that points beyond the boundaries of our own disciplines, our own local communities, uh, our group's cultures towards plausible forms of interdisciplinary uh, dialogue, which is, as I tried to indicate this morning uh, uh, with Bill, uh, a, public, a very public argument for a form of public theology. So against this background, I've argued for distinct and important differences between the reasoning strategies used by theologians and by scientists. But I, in spite of that, I do not go the Gouldian way of Noma, or even with Jonathan Sachs in his a great new book, uh, by the specific distinction between religious is, religion is about meaning and science is about knowledge, if I can oversimplify it somewhat. But I do think there is a way beyond these uh, alternatives. I have organized also that there are some important uh, shared resources for the work we do in theology and science, and also some important uh, rational resources that makes possible the dialogue between these two very different domains of our mental lives. And it is precisely these kind of shared interests and overlapping uh, resources that I believe uh, enable uh, interdisciplinary dialogue. Uh, they are also most expressed clearly, I think, in a notion of transversal rationality, which I won't talk about further, other than to say that I think once we do interdisciplinary work, we develop a skill, I hope, to move across boundaries between disciplines. And that has a specific challenge in the way uh, we are doing uh, theology, for those of us who do this. So in the dialogue between theology and other disciplines, this kind of move across disciplinary boundaries uh, promotes uh, different, non-hierarchical, but equally legitimate ways of viewing very specific topics, very specific problems, traditions, or disciplines, and uh, creates hopefully the kind of space where different voices need not always be in contradiction or in danger of assimilating one another, but are in fact dynamically interactive uh, with, with one another. 
I think this kind of uh, transversal movement between disciplines also opens up a philosophical window, if you want, uh, to a wider world of communication through thought and action, and finally enables us to construct bridge theories between disciplines while, dis while respecting uh, disciplinary, in disciplinary integrity uh, in strategies as different in theology and science. That is a, a really pet topic that I want to work more on. What is it we do when we intuitively cross dis disciplinary borders and start constructing these theories that help us to make connections between very specific scientific uh, uh, ideas or accomplishments that may or may not influence uh, very specific aspects of uh, theologies. So in this way, an interdisciplinary approach carefully thought through can help us identify these kinds of resources uh, and so that we can reach beyond the boundaries of our traditional uh, disciplines. And importantly, it can also enable us to identify possible shared conceptual problems as we negotiate the porous boundaries of our disciplines, which for me is the heart of uh, the kind of thing we do in uh, theology and science. Um, I want to fine tune this a little more by saying that uh, this uh, kind of approach for me is also synonymous with two important things. One is a more fallibilist approach to how we uh, try to achieve accomplishments in, in this kind of field and our contributions to this field, but also to problem solving, uh, if I may quote Larry Loudon, philosopher of science, to a crucial uh, moment in uh, the common language of science and religion. And I think this, the identification of problems might be thought problems, in your sense even, at times, but problems that then uh, become identified as bridges or overlaps for crossing these uh, uh, boundaries, which is why for, for me uh, no solitary discipline by itself, I think, can pr provide the kind of account for the kind of questions we are asking in uh, this interdisciplinary field. So if we take this seriously, I think that in the light of these kinds of implied uh, moves, uh, intellectual moves, um, the self-understanding, now I'm speaking as a theologian, the self-understanding of a theologian or of theologies uh, could and would most probably change uh, as a result of various kinds of pressures, uh, textual pressures, moral, historical, philosophical, theological, and scientific pressures. So in this sense, of course, not just faith, uh, uh, Christian faith or religious faith as such is an evolving phenomenon, but our theories about uh, faith uh, are also evolving in the sense that we constantly identify conceptual theories and we hope to make an advanced advancement, some even would want to talk about intellectual progress uh, in uh, theology and science. So this is an important problem. Uh, what we all are doing in different shapes and forms, what is it that we are accomplishing? Are we advancing the field? Or is the field, the field too broad to even talk about uh, that uh, kind of knowledge? But we all know at least, and this has come through various lectures here, that this kind of epistemological fallibilism will never result in that one maximal ideal modernist knowledge systems. Those days are gone, uh, uh, where uh, instead of that we now know that one perfect representation of God or of the world uh, may not be achieved, but hopefully we could achieve a collage of knowledge that at least could claim in certain senses to be plausible or, or even uh, reliable. So the fact that we uh, do not any longer have preset uh, foundationalist type models to work with uh, or interreligious rules to deal with, of course, does not now mean that therefore all our criteria 
and uh, the data that we use in the work we're doing will be strictly local or con exclusively contextual. On the contrary, none of our criteria, if none of our criteria that we use in our interdisciplinary work were to be acceptable beyond the boundaries of a specific research, uh, research tradition, the giving of rational reasons beyond the boundaries of any tradition would become impossible. So the crucial problem for a theology located in the interdisciplinary conversation, uh, therefore, uh, remains for me the following. Is it at all possible to make sensible and reasonable, some would even want to say rational choices, between different viewpoints and alternative research traditions? I find that one of the most difficult issues to do with as we traverse these different fields and complex uh, uh, givings. I think this, uh, and on this point, again, Larry Loudon, if I may qu quote him one more time, his admonition to scientists and theologians come to mind unless we somehow can articulate criteria for choice between research traditions. We neither have a theory of rationality nor a theory of what progressive growth in knowledge should be like. And this is especially challenging for, uh, for theology and science or religion and science broader conceived. It's very easy to gravitate, for those of us, at least for me as a theologian, it's very easy to gravitate towards those scientists and those forms of science that appeal to me intuitively or that I like more than others. Uh, so, so how do we how do we uh, find warrants uh, for uh, for these cross contextual obligations? Um, I think good. Uh, I hope at least that in both theology and, and the sciences, good arguments could be offered for and against a, a theory choice, or for or against the problem solving. Uh, ability of a research program. And uh, so I want to pull this into the into this one term of problem solving, which I think is the one thing as we talk to scientists and theologians to one another uh, uh, that I think we share as a common language. Of course, for many theologians, it, it is often a stretch to think of our theological theories and doctrines as hypotheses and, and that we are actually attempting to, to solve problems. But I do find that a very helpful uh, way to think about uh, what exactly it is uh, that we are doing. Um, Loudon makes it clear that scientific and other problems are not at all, all, that, uh, all that different and that the differences are often largely a matter of degree. For him, the analysis of problems and the uh, problem solving is the true focus of all forms of scientific thought. But then he goes on to say, as a non-theologian and a non-Christian, I believe, that even theology and philosophy share this kind of problem solving uh, ability and uh, can claim to the ability to identify real problems, whether empirical or conceptual, to that I would add experiential and conceptual, and he, another distinction that he makes is between internal and external uh, problems. He has fleshed that out very nicely for science. I think it's very interesting to think of a whole spectrum of internal uh, problems uh, for theology, and we can think problem of evil, problem of this, problem of that. The other night we had a discussion about the Trinity, which for some people are a big problem, like myself. So, uh, but those are conceptual problems, maybe some would say internal conceptual problems, in, internal to the field of Christian theology. But then I think once we step out into this context, uh, uh, what we are trying to do is to resolve some uh, external problems because they are interdisciplinary problems. So, uh, and in this sense, I think good rationality would be making the most uh, progressive choices, which of course comes with, uh, with, with a lot of challenges. Um,
I think at this point, the, uh, I, would, I would call it a day for that is the first part of my, uh, my speech here. And now I would just like to, with that as a background, give you a brief overview of what I think the field is. Do I still have time? Five minutes? OK, I won't even use that. Uh, uh, the kind of problem identification and problem solving that I hope to be to work well for me uh, in terms of this project. So, if it is true that in interdisciplinary conversation we start out by looking for a shared problem, something that theologians and scientists who are involved could all say, well, here we have a problem, then uh, I would want to say that one of the most fascinating and uh, ubiquitous contemporary uh, cross-disciplinary problems is the problem, of course, uh, what makes us human. Or, as some paleontologists would say, uh, what gives us our species specificity. It's not very politically correct now to talk about uh, human uniqueness, uh, unless you want to qualify that. So, how that might relate to human origins and possibly to the uh, evolution of religious awareness. Now, the underlying argument for this project is that in the search for the nature of the human self or personhood, theology and the sciences may find a surprising uh, and overlapping research trajectory. And as the first stage of this project, I recently uh, published with a friend, some of you will know this, uh, a book uh, called uh, In Search of Self, Interdisciplinary Perspectives on Personhood, in which we invited 18 different scientists, theologians, and philosophers to write on what is a person or what is a human self. The second topic that I'm now, uh, or the second phase of this project, uh, goes as follows. As we all know today, no one trait or one, no one accomplishment should be taken as the single defining characteristic of what it means to be human. That was a huge problem in the history of, the, of uh, doctrine and the thinking about the image of God in trying to pin that down to one trait. But it is an even bigger problem in anthropology and in psychology, I think, to try to do that. So I will argue in this project that it's precisely in the interdisciplinary forum that we may find exciting answers to questions like what makes us persons and what defines the human self. Answers that might ultimately also guide us through the complexity of the current discussion on the evolution of religious, uh, religion and religious uh, behavior. And here, conversations with neuroscience, cognitive science, primatology, and anthropology becomes very necessary. So against this background, my thesis will be that the question of the evolution of religion and religious behavior can never be disentangled from the evolution of embodied human personhood. This will enable us to evaluate contemporary proposals for aspects of human personhood that were all already of great importance Darwin, the evolution of sexuality, the evolution of empathy, the evolution of attachment, the evolution of language, morality, and the religious disposition, to name just a few. Finally, I hope to argue that each of these deeply human traits will have consistently played a defining role in the evolution of human communication and human interpersonal attachment, and along with the evolution of complex symbolic behavior, combine to give us important insights into the evolution of religion and religious behavior. Thanks.